Welcome to today's Ask the Experts webinar, The Golden Rule, Cultivating Kindness and Character Online. I'm your host, Chris Perry, Executive Director of Children and Screens, Institute of Digital Media and Child Development. Amelia Earhart said, a single act of kindness throws out roots in all directions, and the roots spring up and make new trees. For many people, the modern world can feel dark, lonely, even dangerous. The media and online spaces can accentuate this perception, often fostering divisiveness and hostility. Yet it is in these spaces, in that darkness, that a little light, a little kindness, compassion, or caring can have a big impact. Today's workshop will examine these traits, exploring how they develop across childhood and adolescence, and how caregivers and educators can encourage pro-social behavior, both online and offline, and why the intentional cultivation of these traits in today's youth is important for their future. Today's expert panel is composed of leaders in the fields of positive psychology, character education, and youth media use, and they have prepared an informative workshop full of research evidence and practical advice. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to today's moderator, Dr. Stephen Post. Dr. Post is a professor of family population and preventive medicine and the founding director of the Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care and Bioethics at Stony Brook University. He has received countless awards and recognitions for his leadership and contributions to medicine, ethics and life sciences. His best-selling books include The Hidden Gifts of Helping, and Why Good Things Happen to Good People with co-author Jill Nymark. We are honored to have Dr. Post with us to lead today's discussion. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Chris. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to meet you too. I've heard a lot about you. So congratulations on your position. I don't have a lot to say. I just want to make uh, haste uh, to get to our very illustrious uh, panelists. But I do, uh, hope that we can begin this um, event really um, not simply in a, what I will call a hypercognitive modality, but in, in a little bit more of a reflective mode on the nature of kindness itself. And sometimes the best way to do that is to grab a few of one's favorite quotes over the years. Um, and I'm just going to uh, read a couple of these and, and you can contemplate them. From Charles Schultz, in a, word, in a world where you can be anything, be kind, directed to, to kids. And we'll hear about that from Tom Lacona and, uh, and everyone. Uh, the Buddha, be kind to all creatures. This one from a South American philosopher, the language of kindness, appreciate rather than denigrate, commend rather than offend, propose rather than impose, humanize rather than humiliate. The great writer Aldous Huxley, before he died, was interviewed by a reporter from the New York, from the uh, LA Times, who asked him um, what message he wanted to leave to younger generations. And he said, and I quote, it is a little embarrassing that after 45 years of research and study, the best advice I can give to people is to be a little kinder to each other. And then going to Lao Tzu and Taoism, water is the softest thing, yet it can penetrate mountains and earth. This shows clearly the principle of kindness overcoming hardness. And then the great <clears throat> Cambridge, Massachusetts poet E.E. E. Cummings, we do not believe in ourselves until someone reveals that something deep inside us is valuable, worth listening to and sacred to our touch. So in a world where there is, there is certainly too much humiliation, kindness matters. Kind, caring, 
uh, kind helping activities are really powerful in people's development and identity formation. And we're going to be focusing on that now. And without further ado, I want to get started. I will quickly introduce um, Dr. Eva Telzer. Uh, Eva is an associate professor of psychology and neuroscience at UNC Chapel Hill. She's an associate editor at Child Development and Social Cognitive Affective Neuroscience, a prominent journal, and the co-director of the Winston National Center on Technology Use Brain and Psychological Development. So at this point, uh, Eva, can we turn this over to you? Great. Thank you so much for that great introduction today to today's topic. I'm going to share my screen. All right, so I'm going to give just a quick overview on pro-social development in the digital age. So adolescence is a time during which youth learn to contribute to society, whether that be to family, peers, or their community. They engage in behaviors such as sharing and cooperating, helping others in need, volunteering, voting, engaging in activism, staying informed and raising awareness of different issues. And these behaviors tend to increase during the teenage years as youth are developing socio-emotional skills, including perspective taking and empathy. Pro-social behaviors like volunteering and helping others in need are associated with a lot of positive behavioral, emotional, and academic outcomes. For example, children and adolescents who engage in higher levels of pro-social behavior, such as sharing and cooperating, tend to perform better in school. They tend to experience better emotional well-being and also report better mood and positive affect, a greater sense of belonging to their peers and teachers. And these um, outcomes tend to buffer teens against long-term um, maladjustment like depressive symptoms and um, higher levels of stress. So pro-social development is really important during development for all of these really important developmental outcomes. Now, online platforms and digital media have created really, really unprecedented and new forms of pro-social behavior that have been unavailable offline. So these forms of online pro-social behavior are occurring in the context of youth's developmental needs for social and emotional connection, belonging, identity, and purpose. So digital platforms are really connecting teens and adolescents to each other in new ways that allow them to engage in new forms of pro-social behavior that were not available in their offline worlds. So for example, Social media facilitates information sharing beyond adolescents' immediate daily lives. So access to information outside of their kind of school and neighborhood bubble provides them with a greater diversity of perspectives and an ability to engage in ways that might not be readily available in person. Adolescents are able to immediately follow up on the information they receive. So they can forward, comment, follow, like different um, posts, they can um, follow a link to donate money, sign a petition really in, in very quick amounts of time. So the distance between information and action is reduced. In addition, there's social barriers such as physical access that are reduced. So adolescents don't need transportation, for example, to take action online. They can do it from their home, they can do it from their phone, from wherever they are. This can allow adolescents to reach large audiences. They can mobilize large networks. And this is especially important for teenagers that are in communities that are defined by risk where they may not have access to or an ability to engage in these um, broader types of, of pro-social behaviors. Um, and so teenagers can use digital tools to band together to gain access to things like education, to counter negative stereotypes by producing and sharing media, for um, advocating for themselves via um, local governance, governance. And this also makes online pro-social engagement more equitable so that it can reach larger audiences of youth who do not have access 
to traditional forms of pro-social engagement. Finally, um, adolescents can express their civic identities and political stances in creative ways, using videos, creating memes, artwork, and taking agency in new ways that they couldn't do in um, offline forms of pro-social and civic engagement. So they can really be creative in the ways that they um, engage in these types of behaviors. Now these digital platforms provide um, individuals with um, access to um, finding others with similar views. So for example, about 40% of individuals indicate that social media helps them find a platform for finding others with similar views and getting involved in issues that are important to them. And this is especially important for underrepresented groups, providing them a voice giving them a platform to highlight issues that would otherwise not get attention. <clears throat> now, online visibility uh, means that pro-social behavior can reach wider audiences and youth can contribute to really powerful social movements in unprecedented ways. So there's many examples that we've seen in recent news and um, different um, world events that facilitate and show us how social or show us how social media has facilitated information sharing beyond children's immediate daily lives. So youth are increasingly aware of world events from younger ages because they're exposed to this via these online platforms and they can engage with and use social media to lead social activism in really extraordinary ways. So just a few really widespread examples we see, um, we saw in 2018 when Greta Thunberg was just 15 years old, she started a movement, um, a strike against climate change. It started small. She started with um, some um, protests just outside of her school, but soon it went viral over social media, reaching millions and millions of people and prompting protests around the world. She now has over 4 million followers on Twitter and she can spread information very quickly via her followers on this social media platform. She was elected by Time Magazine as a person of the year in 2020. So she made a huge and powerful movement. We saw a very successful social media campaign led by teens in the March for Our Lives campaign, where they used social media to mobilize and spread um, information about gun violence and the impact that it has on adolescents and um, providing information um, on Twitter. So this is Emma Gonzalez, who has over a million followers, providing information for teens on voting access and the importance of engaging in um, different forms of, of um, political activism in order to make change for adolescents. We see really creative ways that adolescents are doing this too. So for example, adolescents and teens under the age of 18, they can't yet vote and are largely unable to participate in political activism, but social media has provided them new and unique ways to participate in political activism. So for example, this is just an example of a TikTok video. I'm not going to play it here, but I'm happy to share the link for anybody interested where um, adolescent users of TikTok engaged in social activism by spreading the word over these um, TikTok videos to encourage each other to reserve thousands of tickets for a political rally. So they were trying to um, take a political stance over this TikTok um, activism. We also see examples of um, children and adolescents trying to make social movements um, against, for example, Seventeen magazine, where a 14-year-old led a change.org campaign against airbrushed images of women. And she um, ended up getting um, um, over 85,000 supporters on her campaign. And thousands of people responded on Twitter, Instagram, and blogs asking women and girls magazines to stop photoshopping women's bodies. And this was a very successful campaign. 17 agreed to stop altering girls' bodies. Um, and so these are, I think, very extreme examples of adolescents um, 
um, political and activism and pro-social behaviors that they engage in in digital spaces. We also see kind of smaller scale examples of this where teens might post funny videos of, um, of different memes or um, cute videos of pets to make their friends um, smile or happy to post positive posts on each other's um, profiles um, and other forms of, of kindness that we see at a much smaller scale. And of course, I don't wanna suggest that all of this is positive. There are some costs to use online pro-social behaviors. So the very thing that makes these online pro-social behaviors successful, so it can spread quickly through networks and be widespread, gives adolescents access to information at a very fast pace, is the very thing that can make it potentially negative. So it's um, online and public, it's highly visible, and it's also more permanent. And so pro-social behaviors online can come with backlash, including bullying or harassment, surveillance, increased public pressure. And so there are some negative things that can come with this online presence. And so just as an example for individuals such as black teens using social media and being exposed to activism in the context of race related issues, can mean risking PTSD, anxiety, and exposure to pretty extreme forms of discrimination, or even a backlash from politicians. So um, when Greta was um, um, making uh, a lot of uh, climate change um, in the social media world, um, at the time, President Donald Trump um, commented on social media. And so there are potentially some negative attention that that individuals can get that can can impact their well-being. So I'll just end with um, a couple of, of potential things that parents can do to promote and encourage positive behaviors online. Many parent educators, researchers themselves are concerned about the dangers of youth's high levels of engagement online. There's oftentimes this divide between what parents no teens are doing online, what teens are doing online, but online social behaviors or online social media behaviors can also be leveraged for many positive behaviors and empowerment by providing a unique platform for youth to engage in pro-social behaviors. So what can parents do to support their teens? So first it's important to really change the focus, which has, I think, been um, portrayed a lot out there that it's not about total screen time or the amount of time that adolescents are engaging on these platforms, but what the quality of their behaviors are when they engage in digital spaces. So if we merely thought about screen time, as much prior research has focused on, we'll miss many of the important ways that adolescents use social media and technology for, for lots of positive behaviors. So it's not about the total time they're spending online, but the quality of the behaviors that they're engaging in. So rather than limiting total screen time, parents should focus more on what teens are doing in those digital spaces. Parents should have open discussions with their teens about what they see and do online rather than restricting overall time on social media. And this means that there's different ways of, of monitoring the way that adolescents engage in online behaviors. So research has shown that adolescents whose parents are actively monitoring their media by engaging in discussions about the different forms of social media that they're, they're um, participating in, what they're doing online, what they see, uh, these types of um, discussions are associated with more pro-social behavior in adolescents, whereas youth with parents who restrictively monitor their social media. So for example, cutting off time spent on social media and restricting it based um, on the time use and being restrictive as opposed to having open dialogue, these adolescents engage in fewer helping behaviors. And so the ways that, that parents um, discuss and talk about adolescents online behaviors can translate into adolescents pro-social behaviors both online and offline. Um, so I'll end there and thank you for um, being here and listening to us. And I look forward to having a discussion with everybody. 
Well, Eva, thank you very, very much. That was a wonderful presentation. We're very grateful. Uh, there is a question uh, which uh, we have for you from one of our uh, audience uh, members, and it goes like this. If online behavior reflects offline realities, isn't altruistic behavior something we have to teach in real time? Question mark. Good question. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and the, an, the short answer is absolutely. <laughs> the, the longer response is that the, the behaviors that adolescents engage in in their everyday lives translate and spill over into their behaviors in other forms. Um, so a lot of the research my lab has done looks at um, pro-social and helping behaviors in the family context. So I think that this is particularly relevant for, again, what can parents do to encourage this? Um, which is um, helping their adolescents or children um, engage in positive behaviors in the home, because those are going to translate and spill over into their behaviors in other contexts. So, for example, adolescents who help more, help their family more on one day, are more likely the next day to help their peers um, and friends. And so the behaviors that they're engaging in, in in their home context spill over and affect the behaviors that they engage in with their friends. Those helping behaviors at home are also related to more positive academic experiences the next day. Um, and so there's a lot of um, these bi-directional effects where the behaviors that are socialized in the home context can really impact adolescents' daily lives in other contexts, whether that be um, more positive behaviors with their friends, more positive behaviors in the school context. We haven't empirically tested whether this spills over into their online behaviors, but just based on the, the, this literature that I'm talking about, I, I imagine that adolescents who are encouraged, supported, and socialized to engage in more positive helping behaviors in the home context that's going to translate into their off their online behaviors as well. So in the moments um, as it's unfolding at home, parents can help their children to develop kindness. They can help their children to engage in helping behaviors. Um, this isn't to say that parents should have or force their children to, to engage in chores and helping that the adolescent or child does not want to do because um, it is really about finding meaning in those behaviors. So um, requiring your child to do chores, for example, is not the same thing as, a, as an adolescent developing the, the competence and meaningful, um, uh, the meaning around why helping around the house is an important behavior. And so it's really developing this character as opposed to forcing or requiring a behavior at home to occur and hoping that that will translate um, into other spaces. Thank you very much. Uh, you actually anticipated uh, a question uh, that's been uh, proposed. I often see a canyon between how children or teens act online versus real life. Parenthetically, they're meaner online. Why is this? Yeah, I mean, online spaces for, for all of the positive ways that they provide opportunities for adolescents to express themselves also um, have aspects to them that create opportunities, quite frankly, to be more aggressive and mean. Um, so for example, the anonymous nature of many platforms mean that, um, that they can say things without necessarily being known that they said those things. Um, the um, lack of immediate feedback. So if you say something mean to a peer's face in person, you're going to see them react and, and um, see the sadness or negative response that comes from that. Whereas um, on online context, you don't get that immediate um, response and the, the kind of empathic responses that you may have in real time are not happening in, in these online context. So there's aspects to the online world that, that facilitate some more um, mean or negative behaviors because of just the very nature of the anonymous nature of it, the um, lack of face-to-face -face nature of it, 
um, and, and just many other aspects to the online world that are different from the offline world. Well, Eva, that was a brilliant answer. And thank you very much. You know, um, I'm a Clevelander when I wanted to get a dose of kindness before there was a lot of online time. I used to go to Pittsburgh and spend an afternoon with Mr. Rogers, who was one of my buddies back there. And, you know, it's such a different world. And what you're doing is very important because it's the world we live in. And we certainly need to have good researchers figuring out how we can convey the quality of kindness, not just the action, but the quality of kindness in young people's lives, because they will flourish when that happens, as you point out so well. So now we're going to let you go. And I'm going to just introduce uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Lacona. So Thomas Lacona is, in my view, a real treasure. Uh, he's a developmental psychologist. He is a professor emeritus in the School of Education at SUNY Cortland. He founded and continues to direct the Center uh, for the Fourth and Fifth R's, in case you're wondering, that refers to respect and responsibility. And he wrote a book, which I keep on my shelf, and I give away about 10 copies a year to different interested people, because parents really want to know the practicalities. How do you raise a caring child in real time? Thanks for that very warm introduction, and thanks, Eva, for that that stimulating presentation has given me a lot to think about. I appreciate very much your research. And thanks for plugging Mr. Rogers, Steve. My kids grew up on Mr. Rogers, and there are two wonderful movies. One is a documentary, and the other is a biopic that deal with Fred Rogers, his impact on the culture. I recommend those to everybody. Uh, my talk, or 10 minutes, has two parts. How can we foster kindness and respect in kindness and family life. And to do that, we need a concept of what good character is. We all know that famous quote from Martin Luther King Jr. I dream of the day all Americans will be judged by the content of their character. And the content of good character is virtue, habits that are objectively good human qualities. We can make that claim because they're good for the individual person and they're good for the whole society. They now enable us to live and work in community. We can maintain that kindness is the heart of good character. Of all the virtues that comprise good character, love has been considered the wellspring of the others and kindness is the very heart of love. But kindness doesn't stand alone. It needs a supporting cast of other essential virtues. And our center's work has actually identified 10 essential virtues that cut across cultures. These are the 10, I'll reference some of them later on. And all these contribute to kindness in everyday life. So kindness needs a supporting cast. There's good news, and that is that there's growing evidence of morality in very young children, including a capacity for kindness much sooner than child development experts once believed. There's a wonderful story that Martin Hoffman tells in his chapter on empathy in a book that I had the privilege to edit. And it's a story about a, a child, Michael, only 15 months old. His friend Paul was visiting and they got to struggling over a toy. Now Paul started to cry. Michael appeared concerned and let Paul have the toy, but Paul kept on crying. Michael then paused, appeared to be thinking, then gave Michael's teddy bear, Michael's own teddy bear to Paul in an attempt to comfort him, but Paul kept on crying. Michael paused again went to the living room and got Paul's security blanket, gave it to his friend Paul, who then stopped crying. Martin Hoffman comments, a child not yet one and a half was able with the help of corrective feedback to assess and respond to another child's needs that differed from his own. Michael's response showed several components that help us understand what's going on. Empathy is one, the ability to enter into the experience of what somebody else is feeling. An empathic child, for example, feels distress when another child is crying. Perspective taking, which is an intellectual skill, the ability to understand what the other person is thinking, feeling, and needs. And finally, kindness, 
which has two components, an attitude of caring about the other person's happiness and taking action to try to, um, to contribute. We can ask how common is early kindness. There was a wonderful study done at the Max Planck Institute. An adult accidentally close dropped something and uh, a one and a half year old was observing, what would that child do? And the research found that nearly all the toddlers help usually within seconds. And these are some of the other findings. And impressive results at an early age. Now, does this mean we're naturally good? And the answer to that is clearly no. The capacity for both kindness and cruelty is present from an early age. Here's a mom who speaks about what her autistic son is enduring. Um, children remind me of chickens seeking out the weak and wounded and pecking them to death. Uh, they torture her child in the playground in that way. And there's great deal of evidence about the global problem of bullying. One out of three students reports that experience. Some experience it for years. Bully students are viewed as different from their peers in some way and are chosen for peer persecution because of that difference. Uh, there are some sex differences in terms of when that peaks between boys and girls, but both sexes engage in it. The impact of bullying is tremendous. We want our children to have some sense of this as well as parents. There was a major study done collaboratively by Duke and a UK university and following up people in adulthood, those who had experienced bullying chronically were much more likely as adults to seek therapy for depression, anxiety, and so on. And in fact, the chronic effects of bullying were greater than those of parental abuse. So bullying is still a serious problem. What works to reduce it? A lot of programs don't make a difference. Some do, some even make it worse. There was an analysis done that identified those programs that were effective, and you can see the components of those. They changed the norms regarding it from being okay to not cool, increased supervision, consequences for the behavior, uh, students becoming support for uh, victims and the like, and parent awareness. The most effective program, according to the global research, is the Olvaeus one, and those are some of the data from that particular program as implemented in the U.S., there are other programs with supportive evidence as well. This is the one usually singled out as the most effective. So what is our task as parents? Certainly to develop our own children's capacity for kindness. Second, to curb their capacity for cruelty. Third, to foster the courage to come to the aid of victims of injustice and unkindness. And finally, to encourage our schools to implement effective character ed. To raise kind and respectful children in the home, there are two fundamental tasks I think we have as parents. One is to help them build a strong personal character. This is the work of habit formation. And second, to build a strong family culture that brings out the best in all family members. Now, we don't have to start from scratch with a blank slate. There's good guidance we can get from available parenting research. Here's a meta-analysis of 76 studies carried out by Marvin Berkowitz and his colleague, John Grich, looking at studies in the US, Canada, and the UK. And they identified eight different character outcomes that fell within their broad definition of moral character. You see those on the screen ranging from empathy to self-control. They identified five super practices that they called the fabulous five, parenting practices that related to at least two, often more, of those eight positive character outcomes. And those were setting high expectations, helping kids to meet them. That was how authority was used, nurturance, how love was expressed, modeling, acting in the ways we want children to imitate, reasoning, helping kids understand how their behavior affects others, and empowerment, giving children voice and responsibility in family life. Now, the fabulous five identified by Berkowitz and Grich align with other parenting research, notably the work of Diana Baumrein, identifying three styles of parenting, authoritarian, high on authority, but low on love, permissive, high on love, but low on the exercise of authority, and authoritative, which integrates authority and love in a balanced way. Authoritative, authoritative parenting is characterized by the qualities you see listed there. Um, some were surprises. One, for example, that the parent values both obedience to adult requirements and independence in the child. The parent gives children voice, but reserves the right to final decisions. So there's a balance of authority and love. And research, Bob Rines and that of other investigators have found that at all developmental levels, early childhood, middle childhood, adolescence, the most confident 
capable and morally responsible kids have authoritative parents. Now the fabulous five and authoritative parenting give us a conceptual uh, framework for thinking about parenting based on good evidence, but they don't give us really specific concrete practices that show the art of parenting in, in the fall of family life. They don't, for example, explain how to create a family culture of character that capitalizes on the positive power of the group. So how does one create that sort of intentional family culture? There are two kinds of strategies that I'll illustrate. There are small steps we can do tomorrow. There are bigger steps that require more time and commitment to sustain, including some things that don't come naturally to parents. Some small steps first. We can teach why kindness matters. We make other people happy when we treat them kindly, and we are happiest ourselves when we do so. We're really hardwired to be happier, and we're healthier when we do good. Stephen's uh, research has provided abundant evidence of this connection. We can use the language of kindness and respect in natural ways. Would you be kind enough to help your sister pick up the family room? That was a kind thing to do. Thank you for your kindness. Language matters. It conveys family values. When kids aren't kind, we can ask them to do a redo. Uh, for example, could you say that in a more respectful way? What would be a kinder way to say that to your little sister? And we want to make it clear that we as adults are also striving to be better. Everybody's character, yours and mine, is a work in progress. We can start a meal with sharing about kindness. What's something kind or helpful you did for somebody today? Something kind someone did for you? A kind act you observed? What's something you're grateful for? Our younger son and his family often start with a round of gratefuls. Gratitude is an act of kindness. Ingratitude is a form of unkindness. Uh, here's one family's tradition where they put their appreciation of their children's developing character and talents and so on in writing. And that goes in a letter under the Christmas tree, a powerful ritual that means a great deal to the children in that family. We want to increase our one-on-one -on -one time, which is especially powerful in building our bond and influence with our children. Here's a busy school superintendent who reserves a Saturday afternoon for each of his four kids. Christian Barnard tells a wonderful story about his own father so I remember on Sunday afternoons, we'd walk to the top of the hill by the dam, sit on the rock and look down on the town below us. And then I would tell my problems to my father. He would speak of his to me. Meaningful one-on-one -on -one time, as I said, uh, increases our influence in a world of competing influences. We want to love and respect our children as individuals, help them to develop their interests and talents in a way it gives them a sense of being an individual person. Um, I have a friend who does therapy with families she tells a story, for example, about Molly, who had always been a polite and obedient child, got good grades, played soccer for her dad's team, and so on. And when she turned 15, she started running with a fast crowd, skipping school, doing drugs, and having sex. And in therapy, she screamed at her father, I always did everything for you. I never did anything I wanted to do. So we want children to develop as individuals and to respect that individuality, help them develop their own sense of identity. Bigger steps involved. Uh, we want to protect daily time to talk and reconnect in our relationship with the other parent, keep the love growing, get on the same page regarding our values and basic expectations, don't undercut the other parent in front of the child, a very important uh, thing to remember. Um, when we have conflicts and arguments, there need to be ways of making up and moving on. Research shows healthy families have rituals that do that. If you're a single parent, find at least one other buddy parent, share experiences, give each other support, it's a very, very important support system. The research on people who rescued Jews in the Holocaust has some instructive things uh, for our, our own parenting compared to non-rescuers. Rescuers were much more likely to say their parents both modeled and directly taught moral values. One woman said, my mother always said, do some good for someone at least once a day. So the counsel here is to practice what you preach and preach what you practice. Uh, discipline varied depending upon uh, whether you rescued or didn't. Rescuers remember their parents as occasionally, only occasionally punishing, much more often explaining things, helping them take perspective. They taught appreciation of other cultures and religions. Uh, one man said, my father taught us to love God and neighbor, regardless of race or religion. And the owners concluded that rescuers' parents fostered an extensive orientation, an attitude of caring that went beyond their immediate circle. Some families have found it very valuable to sit down and make a mission statement, asking the question, what kind of family do we want to be? Identifying the qualities that they all are willing to aspire to, 
and write those out in a set of we statements. Here's a family with four kids that has done that. And they find this to be a very helpful as a reference point in building a family culture in their own home. The dad says that the greatest benefit we think will be long-term when there are bigger problems in the teens, we're not starting with a blank slate. It gives you a sense of shared purpose and identity. This is how we live. This is who we are. And then need, there's a need to follow through, obviously. The mission statement is a big step forward, but follow-ups, family chats, discussions to solve everyday problems, whether it's bedtime battles, getting the kids off to school in the morning, screen policies or hassles uh, about chores. Um, this gives children a voice, enables them to, to contribute to solutions. Everybody signs the agreement. And then you do a follow-up a couple days later or a week later, how are things better? Um, and here's an actual story of two young children where they implemented the failing meeting approach and with good results. And uh, the mom said, we're, you know, things are a lot better. There have been a lot of yelling and scolding, but the family meeting made a big difference. Children are taking on an authentic responsibility here. They're really becoming co-creators of a happy family. And what about when kids are not kind? Here I recommend what I call character-based discipline, um, insisting on kindness and respect in all family interactions, just not parent-child, but among siblings as well. And then if anyone violates that norm, what's the fair consequence for speaking disrespectfully? Kids get a reminder, but there has to be a consequence and they can have voice in that as well. Um, parents should model this when they have arguments. They should show that they are able to make up and, and move on. They and also by how they talk about people outside the family. That sets an example as well. When we correct her, her flashes, we need to do so with clarity and also feeling. Here's a, a research study that looked at how kids responded to somebody crying on the playground. Some just watched, others were indifferent. Some were altruistic responders. And the mothers of the kids who are altruistic responders actually used the combination of clear teaching and, and did so with feeling. Uh, one little girl had pulled another child's hair, and the mom's correction was, you hurt Amy, pointing to the effect. Pulling hair hurts. Never pull hair. By contrast, mothers whose kids did not respond uh, compassionately reacted more casually when their own child did something hurtful. Well, that's not very nice. Don't do that. So the mother's response was bloodless. So they have to teach right and wrong clearly, but with feeling we want kids to know that a hurtful action is wrong, but also to feel that it's wrong. We want them to also be able to make amends. Correction shouldn't end with kids feeling bad. The next question is, what can you do to make up for it? And there are all kinds of options, but it's really important that kids learn to do something positive to set things right. And that should include the opportunity for empathy and kindness as well. Real responsibilities, I even brought up chores. I agree that kids should have a voice, but they certainly should have family responsibilities. Otherwise, we find ourselves raising entitled kids like the boy who said, why should I mow the lawn? It's not my lawn. And um, there's research showing that kids who have meaningful jobs in the family have a greater concern for people beyond the family. Here's a great website of a mother in Canada with 10 kids, and she's got a Saturday morning system for chores that they think has lots of good tips. And then kids need to learn in family life how to solve conflicts. When I've done marriage and family counseling, I find many people who have never had any sort of experience that helps them acquire the skills of solving conflicts in a way that's peaceful and meets mutual needs. There could be a talk it out space in family life, a script that kids follow. They'll need practice learning those steps and we'll have to patiently coach them through them. And remembering what we do when we teach a sports skill, for example, uh, the kids need tons of practice learning how to bat a ball or serve a tennis ball. And it requires practice, 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 demonstrating the skill, corrective feedback, it's the same with character skills, lots of coaching, lots of practice. And finally, supervision matters a lot. The research shows in building a better team that the, that the most responsible kids, the ones least likely to engage in risk behaviors, have parents who know where their kids are and what they're doing. Finally, if you have religious faith, share it with your children. The research shows there are positive pro-social outcomes of, of practicing faith and taking it seriously. And one of the ways is to help kids choose friends who are not engaged in harmful or antisocial behaviors. Uh, the, there's good news in that a lot of parents now feel that their kids are on screens too much, and they are beginning to monitor that more closely. Uh, as Eva pointed out, the way we approach this matters a lot. Um, there's an organization, American College of Pediatricians, that has, has lots of specific screen policies that I think can give parents useful guidance out of the gate. Um, 
I'd recommend their website. There, there's an elaborate um, paper that, that spells these out in some detail. And there are practical helps for parents that give them more control over what comes in, what kids have access to. We know the internet, internet is a source of lots of positives, but also many negatives. These are some of the screen resources I felt help, helpful. Uh, we need a plan. Many families don't have a family media plan. This is another chance they have children involved collaboratively in discussing this, sitting down and asking, uh, what is consistent? What we value and believe as a family? Let's come up with something that works. And to explain why you're doing this, you're not trying to rain on kids parade. It's not because you want to you know, spoil their fun, but you, it's because you, you care about them. It's the same rationale for any limits that we set uh, in our children's uh, upbringing. Supervision can take different forms. It's helpful to write down the rules. Kids pledge to follow them. Uh, have the computer in a public space, ideally. Let kids know you'll be monitoring their activity and, and let your friends know we're doing that together. That can in inhibit uh, negative things that might otherwise happen. Teach that the golden rule applies online, just as in real life. And teach what the golden rule is in different religions and cultures. I think it's potentially powerful to post this in a family. What are all the forms that this takes worldwide? Other things to teach, um, the internet has some special challenges and dangers. You can't take things back, it's out there forever. It can have an impact you couldn't possibly imagine. Also, it's hard to convey tone through um, internet messages, through text or, or whatever. And, and we need to take care to choose words that convey courtesy and warmth. Challenges are multiple that are posed by screens. They disrupt a number of things, including sleep that can create a lot of interpersonal behavior problems. Uh, video games can show up in attention difficulties. I recommend the work of Victoria Dunkley, an, an MD who's published a book that's been useful to me, Reset Your Child's Brain. She saw tons of parents who were having kids with meltdowns and all kinds of behavior problems, even if they had enough sleep. She started a course, Save Your Child's Brain. She got uh, emails from people around the world who tried her electronic fast and reported um, uh, truly amazing results, even in a short period of time. Kids would battle the, the thing at first, but then begin to sleep better, behave better, listen better, show better manners, show greater empathy and the like. And, um, and then you can begin to restore normal screen time slowly and to observe your children's reactions. One mother gives a testimony of this sort. Both of her young children showed dramatic improvements from this electronic fast. So we need to help our kids maintain a healthy brain. And EVIS research is important in pointing us toward that. Now, there's also uh, research on what screens may promote that's probably problematic, that's toxic. High levels of exposure to violence can increase aggression. High levels of exposure to sexual content can stimulate the wrong kind of activity in that realm. Cyber building is something just, we need just, to discuss. Just, with just one minute. And okay. <laughs> there's a lot of this out there. Um, our kids need to know what the impact is on kids who are experiencing either kind of bullying in school or cyber. Uh, it can have a tremendously painful impact. We can share real life stories. Here's a young woman, the story was told on the front page of the New York Times. A uh, gang of girls gang, uh, began to persecute her. She ended up jumping from a tower and taking her life. Uh, two of the girls were charged with a malicious harassment. harassment. One apologized, one did not. Here's the child who committed suicide. We want to teach our kids to be peer allies. The research shows that those kids who step up and provide emotional support uh, attenuate the negative effects of bullying. Uh, there are stories of compassion and courage, more than 1,300 on this wonderful website. People have stuck out their necks for other people. Uh, kids need to know the dangers of, of anxiety and depression from too much screen time and to get out in the real world doing service, perhaps with a parent. Um, conversation matters. The Harvard Family Dinner Project makes available wonderful conversation starters for families to use. Um, and there's the repetition of that slide. Pornography is a new danger, a book I recommend. I'll just fast forward to it. Uh, a lot of research on, on the horrible stuff that, that internet porn shows and the impact on teens as well as on children. Uh, it's well documented now in global um, research analysis. Families can make use of a, of a small book that I've recommended to families where parents are able to discuss this and to give them a strategy if somebody shows them pornography. Uh, can, a can-do strategy. Um, there's a wonderful website that can also be of great use. And here's something that's very good for middle schoolers and high school kids initially developed by college students. Books are another great source. So are 
some of our, our, our wonderful films. Here's a couple of great articles. Uh, picture books can be a wonderful thing to start at an early age. Uh, this is a wonderful resource on helping to correct bad habits. Um, uh, this is something that my grandchildren and I have enjoyed watching together, Charlie and Lola, a British series where Charlie is wonderfully kind to his younger sister. And there are all kinds of wonderful movies that give us powerful examples of kindness, courage, respect, and so on. And don't just watch a good movie, talk about it. Okay, there, there you have it. Thank okay, you. thank you very, very much. You know, uh, your whole life has been devoted to this topic really for 40 years. And um, it would be impossible to really give you all the credit that in my view you deserve, but I've followed your work for many, many decades, and I really am grateful uh, for what you have uh, contributed to our culture. And your stuff is so practical. You know, if you're a parent and you want a really useful tip, well, you know, get that value statement on the refrigerator. <laughs> you know, it's just so awesome. So now um, um, I'm actually gonna, gonna, gonna just move forward to our next speaker because that went a, went a little longer. Okay, so very good. If we, uh, if we do that, but thank you very, very much. That was just terrific. So our next presenter is Rick Weisbord, and he is a senior lecturer on education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and also at the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, he is the faculty co-director of the Human Development and Psychology uh, MA program. He uh, also directs the Making Caring Common Project, which is one that I've been following over the last four or five years, and is the author of many books, including The Parents We Mean to Be, How Well-Intentioned Adults Undermine Children's Moral and Emotional Development. So there is such a thing as unwise parenting, but well-intentioned. So can we just turn this over now uh, to Rick, please? Thank you, Stephen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I really want to talk about two things. I want to talk about the cultural signals that we send to kids about what's important or what's valuable. And like Tom, I also want to talk about things that parents can do and families can do to raise kids who are not only kind, but kids who are justice minded, who care about people who are different from them, who care about the common good. Um, but let me start with the cultural signals and what I think of as the problem. And it is the degree to which we have elevated these aspects of success, achievement, and happiness as the primary goals of child raising and demoted or marginalized concern for other people and concern for the common good. And over the last five or six years, we have probably in surveyed 50,000 high school students, very diverse in terms of race, culture, and class. And we have asked them a, a simple question. I'm gonna abbreviate a lot of research, but basically the question is, What's most important to you, being happy, achieving at a high level, or caring for other people? We've also asked them to imagine, how do you think your parents would rank these things for you? Is it more important to your parents that you're happy, that you're high achieving, or that you're kind, or that you're caring for other people? In a nutshell, about 80% of students rank some aspect of their success, achievement, or happiness as more important than caring for other people. When we ask them, how they imagine their parents would rank these values, they were even more likely to think that their parents would prioritize achievement and happiness than they, than they themselves prioritize um, achievement and happiness. Um, they also thought their parents would be three times more proud of them if they got good grades in school than if they were caring community members in class or school. And I want you to pause and think about this for a minute because I think the degree to which we have elevated these aspects of success and subordinated or sidelined caring for other people, caring for the common good may be unprecedented in our history. And if you are concerned as I am about the hyperpolarization we have in this country, the fragmentation we have in this country, the demonization that we have in this country, the hostility that we routinely see in our public interactions and many of our private interactions, the hyper individualism we see in our country, you know, there are days where I feel like we are falling apart at the seams. 
And I think one big reason for this, and this is a puzzle with many pieces, is that we have not prioritized caring for other people and we have not prioritized caring for the common good in child raising in ways that we did at other times in our history, ways that we did in schools and ways we did in our families in ways we did in our religious institutions. All of these things are things we can discuss. They're big topics. Um, let me just turn just in the interest of time to things that I think we as a family, we as families can do to raise kids who are caring and justice minded. And much of this does overlap with things that, that Tom has said, but I, I really wanna underscore the importance of making it a priority. And there are times um, where, you know, happiness, your own happiness and other people's happiness collide, your own interests and other people's interests collide. And we really need to teach kids to balance their own interests and other people's interests. That means that they have to reach out to a friendless kid in the playground, even though they may not want to do that. They need to pass the ball in a game, even though they may want to shoot. They need to help kids on a test, even though it's graded on a curve. Um, they can't be rude to us and they can't be rude to other people. Um, these are ways in which the day-to-day -day in the water ways in which we make caring for other people a priority. Rather than saying to kids, the most important thing is that you're happy. What if we said to them, the most important thing is that you're kind. It was either Henry or William James. I can't remember who said there are three things that are important in life. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third is to be kind. I also agree with, with Tom that, that practice really matters. Um, I'm a great believer in, in chores. Um, one of the ways in which you develop a moral identity is by practicing acts of altruism and kindness and integrity and trust. That's how they become, these actions become part of who you are, part of your system. And that families create an identity of around kindness and concern for others when it's practiced day to day, when, they, when kids do pitch in around the house, when they do chores, when they help in the community, when they do service, when this is the day, these are the day-to-day -day, um, activities of family life. This is what we do in this family. I know when my kids were young, they would sometimes clear a, clear the, a dish or they would put a fork and a knife on the, on, on, the, on, um, on the table and they would say, dad, I cleared the, the dish. And, you know, I think one of the things that we don't want to do is praise kids for simple acts for those kinds of actions. Um, you don't get a trophy. You don't. You're not Cinderella because you put a dish on the on the table. This is what we do as a family. This is our family identity. We pitch in. We help out people. We are also democratic, and I think Tom is absolutely right about this. That you want kids to have input in key decisions. You want them, and that's a practice as well. You want them to participate in family life and to feel like. Um, they have input in decisions that affect them, um, and particularly decisions that affect, and, and that's how they develop a sense of justice, and that's how they become aware of other people's perspectives and learn how to coordinate their own perspective with other people's perspectives. I also think that we need to expand kids' circle of concern, and here's what I mean by this. Often when you talk about caring, we talk about it as like a quantity. You either have it, a lot of it or a little bit. When we talk about empathy, we often talk about as having a lot or a little, but almost everybody cares for somebody. Almost everybody has empathy for somebody. The much bigger issue or another big issue in my mind is who do we care for? Do we care for people who are different from us in race or class or gender or sexual orientation or gender orientation or political orientation or religious orientation? Do we care for people who are different from us? Do we care for people? Do we help kids and guide kids in caring for people who may fall off their screen? Do we help them care for the bus driver, for a server in the restaurant, for a custodian in, in their school building, for the school secretary? Do we put these people on our kids' screen? And I emphasize caring across difference because it's important in itself, but also because I think it's the foundation of justice, that when you can understand, value, take the perspectives, of the multiple diverse people in your communities, you can represent their interests in decisions around fairness and justice. If you can't appreciate people who are different from you, 
you can't represent those interests in the same way. Um, I agree with what Tom and uh, Christian, I think both said about modeling. Um, we have to model caring for other people, caring for people who are different from us. We have to model pursuing justice. We have to model grappling with ethical dilemmas, times when values collide. These things are very important for us to, for our kids to see us doing that um, ethical, the leading an ethical life is, is work. It is struggle, it is grappling. Um, it can be exciting work, it can be invigorating work, but there are times where um, loyalty and justice collide, for example. Should you be honest with your teacher if a friend of yours um, steals a pen from another kid in the class when you know that that teacher might get that kid into a lot of trouble and that kid is having already having a very hard time at home. Uh, these are not simple, these questions don't have simple answers. Should you invite someone to a birthday party um, who has been mean to your best friend and your best friend doesn't want that person to come? Kids should see us wrestling with, with these kinds of questions and taking multiple perspectives and talking about principles of fairness and how to realize those principles. Let me just all say that I don't think the expectation is that we should be perfect role models. We should be living, breathing, imperfect human beings, people who make mistakes. And a lot of the learning that I think our kids around ethical issues, especially a lot of the learning that I think our kids will gather from us is if we are self-aware, self-observing, stringent about our own mistakes and able to talk to them about our mistakes in ways that they understand and that make sense to them. Let me make a case for just one other practice in families or one other form of, of principle that I think is very important. Um, and that's helping kids manage destructive feelings. I, you know, the research seems to show pretty convincingly that the, by the time kids are five or six years old, they basically know the values. They know that honesty is important or that adults think honesty is important, that caring is important, that fairness is important. The much bigger issue is two things. One is how do those values become part of your identity? How do you internalize those values? For John Lewis, who walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, or Martin Luther King, um, or Gandhi, you know, they don't talk about these actions as a choice. Tom mentioned the Oliner studies. Um, the people in the Oliner studies, the, the Dutch who rescued the Jews don't talk about a choice. They talk about it as part of their identity, as fundamentally who they are. But the other thing that, that gets in the way is that is our feelings, that emotions are the engines of our moral life, that shame, envy, jealousy, frustration, fear, anger can all cause us to violate other people. Usually when we transgress, it's not because we didn't know right from wrong. It's because we were flooded, swamped, overwhelmed with a feeling we couldn't control. I still play pickup basketball and I was playing pickup basketball the other day and somebody said, who's covering the old guy? And I'm looking around like, well, who, who are you talking about? And then a friend of my team said, well, Rick, I'm like, of course they are talking about you. But now I'm riled up, now it's war. Like we are all, I'm, I'm not defending this. This was not my proudest moment but we are all vulnerable to, to feelings of embarrassment or shame or, ang or anger or envy. And it's vital that we help kids to manage these feelings. And I wanna make a distinction between guilt and shame. And I worry especially about shame because I think shame is the cause and Jim Gilligan's work, other people's work, that shame is so often the cause of violence. Um, it is so often the cause of bullying, of delinquency, um, of behavior problems of many kinds. Um, you know, guilt is uh, when you violate one of your principles. Guilt is a deed, it's an action. And the good news about guilt is that it typically insists on and reveals a path to repair itself. You can make amends, you can apologize. Shame is the public exposure of defects in the self. And I think in our social media life, we are especially vulnerable to the public exposure of defects in the self. And so that we really need to talk to kids about both how to avoid situations that flood with them with shame, but also 
strategies for managing shame. I want to stop there. Um, I would love, I hope there's still time for questions, but yes. I just want to give you one takeaway. And that takeaway is if I were to focus on one thing, it would be appreciating across, helping your kids appreciate across difference. Um, and because I think it's so important to self and because I think it's such a critical foundation for justice. Thank you. Yeah, Rick, thank you very much for giving that emphasis to the extensivity to getting away from myopia and having a sense of a shared humanity. That's so important. And a lot of times when we talk about kindness, uh, you know, it's dyadic, it's purely familial, and there are strong in-group, out-group uh, barriers, but uh, I think you're so correct in that. And uh, I think you would agree it's better to be always kind than always right. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I tell my medical students. We have a question for you, which is a good one. Uh, and I, and I think you'll you'll enjoy it. Does kindness look different in teenagers, or is meanness developmentally adaptive for this age? So, you know, I I would say that it's important to, to sort of complicate the view of teenagers. I think there's this view of teenagers that they're inherently selfish, that they kind of spin out of our orbit as parents and they become these egotistical human beings. They become these sort of aliens for this period of time. And then if we're lucky, they'll return back to our orbit um, and they'll be good people. And you know what I think what you see among teenagers and you know people like Eric Erickson pointed this out a long time ago is they can be deeply loyal, deeply generous, deeply committed to causes of different kinds. They can also be very selfish in some ways. They can be all of those things. I mean, they are, they are complicated people and they can vacillate from moment to moment from being kind to being selfish. You know, there are forms of sarcasm and, uh, and, and banter among teens that may appear disrespectful that I think can be quite intimate sometimes. There are other forms of sarcasm and banter and answer the question of how it looks. That sometimes adults misunderstand forms of banter and sarcasm as, as cruelty. Um, but I also think there are forms of sarcasm and banter that can be cruel. Um, so, you know, I think it's really important to ask, you know, that teens are often talking in ways to be an investigator as an adult that are hard for adults to understand. And it's important to ask what, what is meant. And it's important to ask people who have been subjected to a comment that seems mean, how it made them feel. Uh, I think it, as adults, we need to be sort of more literate about the teen world. There's a high wall that separates in many communities, the world of teenagers and the world of adults. And we have a lot of teenagers in our research and our work who don't have any connections to school adults or community adults. And that's a very dangerous situation to be in. And I think it is one reason mental health problems are so high among teens. So I'm giving you a long answer to the question, Stephen, sorry about that. But the, the answer is that I do feel like as adults, we need to bridge this gap to the teen world and be more available and um, more willing to listen. Okay, well, there's nothing like attentive listening for a teenager. I'll tell you. We all know that. So we're going to open this up. We're going to throw it into a community dialogue. We have uh, a very interesting uh, community here. Uh, and uh, these questions can be uh, directed uh, at Tom uh, or um, at Rick. Uh, we don't have uh, Eva with us at this point. Uh, so uh, let's uh, let's just uh, start it off. There, there's there's one thing already uh, on the um, there's like oh, okay okay let's see okay there's, there's one thing already on the on the chat. Do you feel it is it is the responsibility of the education system to integrate character education into schools, and how can you motivate teachers to buy in? And another thing here is. Can we apply these same practical strategies? I guess uh, this particularly might go to, uh, to Tom's comments, all cultures, or does character education look different for people from different backgrounds? Two, two, two good things. So where does the school system fit in? Uh, and also 
What about the cross-cultural dynamics of character education? Who'd like to take a try at that? Um, well, uh, Rick is very humble to toss the ball my way. His Making Caring Common project at Harvard, of course, is doing a lot to create cultures of character, cultures of justice and caring in our schools. Um, I think that there's been for three decades now, a national character education slash social emotional learning movement in the country, which is a revival and renewal and expansion of something that was once more a part of schools before a focus on test scores took over. And it has overwhelming support from parents, overwhelming support from teachers. What it requires is good school leadership that makes time for thoughtful planning, for doing it in ways that are deep and, and sustainable and transformative instead of ways that are cosmetic and window dressing and don't really change school culture or change the character of the people who inhabit it. So character education has a lot of support, it can be done well, it can be done superficially. And I think getting people on board professionally, you know, as faculty is a matter of giving them the, the time they need to talk with each other, the time they need to reflect on what they're doing, is what's working, what isn't, what needs improvement. You know, that sort of reflective time is absolutely crucial for quality academic uh, teaching and learning. It's, it's necessary for doing a good job on developing character. But there's good news in that more and more schools have acknowledged the necessity of this. And really, it doesn't come down to anything foreign. The, the, the dual mission of all schools is to help kids do their best work and to help them become their best selves in relationships, to work well, to respect others. And, and so it's really all about school improvement in those two fundamental senses. Um, what was the other piece of the question? I'm, I mean, character was one piece. And the other one was the cross-cultural question. And oh, that's yeah, pretty relevant to a lot of the practical suggestions that you've laid out. So um, that's, a, that's a good question because I think we can learn a lot from cross-cultural differences. I, th I think that many of these processes are, are rooted in human nature. For example, kindness, you know, we're happier, more fulfilled when we treat each other kindly than we are if we tr treat them cruelly and disrespectfully. I think there is such a thing as human nature. There are, are clearly different ways that all this plays out. Um, there, there's a book recently, for example, I recently came across about German parenting, which gives kids much more independence at an earlier age. There's much less helicopter parenting. There's another book called uh, French Kids Don't Throw Food, which indicates you can take your French three-year-old to a fine restaurant and for two hours, they'll be well-behaved. So these are very good for wondering, you know, are we setting our, setting the bar too low in many ways in our own culture uh, with whether it's overprotecting kids, whether it's not expecting enough behavior uh, of a responsible sort, whether it's not giving them sufficient independence to allow them to grow. So there are real cultural differences that I think we can learn from, but I also think some of these things are, are bedrock human nature stuff. And Rick, can you respond to these questions? Yeah, I'd be deli delighted to. Um, and I, you know, I, I agree with I agree with Tom. I mean, in, in terms of schools, I don't think schools have a choice. I think schools are always affecting character. We are always affecting character <laughs> interactions with kids. Teachers are always making decisions about fairness. They are also displaying kindness or not displaying kindness. And they're acting with integrity and honesty or they're not. It, the, the question is, are we going to do those things intentionally and are we going to do those things well? And um, you know, Tom has been in this field for many, many years. He's absolutely right that there are uh, a mountain of literature at this point about, um, about practices and principles that work in schools. I think there's an implementation issue, and Tom sort of alluded to it, which is people, principals who are deeply committed to this work and um, want to do it in comprehensive ways and can get their faculties on their staff on board can make lots of progress. Making Caring Commons in a somewhat different space because we don't assume, you know, we're just concerned about those schools as well that don't have principals who have this deep commitment and don't have the faculty or the staff um, who share the commitment and want to lead this work. And so, you know, our strategy is, and this is a strategic decision, is much more 
to go to principals, but also go to teachers themselves and to give them practices and resources that are low burden, that are engaging, that are energizing, that they can use in their classrooms that build empathy and gratitude and better understanding of justice. And the idea is that if you give them those strategies, they will become, a, and they work, they will become a catalyst and many more of those schools will be motivated to do deeper and more comprehensive work. So it's a, a strategic decision um, and people, good people disagree about, <laughs> about this. Um, in terms of the second question, I think culture matters a lot. And I agree with Tom about this. And partly, you know, the values are expressed different ways in different cultures. Parents have different notions about values, to, to how values develop in different cultures. The challenges to developing certain values are different in different cultures. Just to give you one example, you know, when I am speaking or doing work in white privileged communities, I talk to parents a lot about entitlement and the importance of understanding privilege and entitlement and kids having empathy for people who don't have um, the resources that, that they do, the privileges that they do. That's a very important starting point for moral development, I think, in affluent communities. That is not where I would start you know, when I'm speaking in low-income communities. Um, and you know, you know, for, for low-income kids, you know, a lot of it is dealing with a, a history of being marginalized and not having opportunity and being invisible. And you know, a lot of it is how do you resist in ways that are healthy given those circumstances? I mean, it's a very different question. It's a very different moral trajectory. So I think you know, I, this is just one example. I just I think many of the principles of, of, of moral guidance are the same across culture, but the starting points are different, the pathways are different, um, and that we really need to be attuned to these, these cultural differences. Okay. So I'm looking at time now. It's 1.25, and we really just have a, a three or four minutes uh, uh, left. Uh, and I think what I'm going to do is take the liberty of just a quick wrap up. And then we will uh, turn things over uh, to Chris, who will bring a conclusion to our activities. Um, you know, uh, we have a school across the street here in Stony Brook. It's a prep school, and it has a very nice motto, which you read boldly from the street. It says, character before career. So it's got real material content. On the other hand, we have a beloved university where I am, and its motto is far beyond. Beyond what? I have no idea. But I think you're it's so correct that we need to create cultures in our institutions. And, um, you know, um, uh, you both mentioned Sam Oliner, who unfortunately passed away just a year ago. Uh, he was really, in a lot of ways, the great pioneer going back to Germany and interviewing all those rescuers and he himself was rescued. So I wanna just pause and, and, and uh, give him a little shout out uh, uh, wherever he might be. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I would just say that um, leadership, school leadership, college leadership was always focused on moral qualities, on character. I'm not sure that's the case now, but things have changed and, and we can move back in that direction. Uh, so this is beautiful. And how in the end, uh, the matrix, the world of screens, uh, Screenagers is a great video, by the way. Um, uh, the, the person who did that remarkable documentary uh, was on our faculty in this center, uh, Delaney Rustin, when she was doing that, she was our documentary film maker in residence for a number of time of years. She's going back to Seattle. But Screenagers is a really gripping, dramatic uh, investigation in real live time of how deeply divisive things can get when parents try to control screen time. So I think you know that's a big issue. It's something that everyone addressed. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll learn better and better techniques. So without any further ado, just to thank everybody, but Chris, why don't you conclude us and, and uh, we'll leave it to you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Eva, Thomas, and Richard for sharing your knowledge and advice around the lessons that kids really need. 
Thank you to our attendees as well for taking the time today to join us. The Ask the Experts webinar series will take a brief two month hiatus for the summer. Webinars will resume in August when we will discuss education technology and digital learning just in time for the back to school season. In the meantime, you can visit our website at childrenandscreens.com or check out all of our previous Ask the Experts webinars on Children and Screens YouTube channel. You can also follow us on the platforms listed here to stay up to date on the Institute's latest programs and the latest news in the field of digital media and child development. Until next time, we hope you all have a great summer and remember, be kind. <laughs>